Morris Berman, Participation and Embodiment. As I have said, Morris Berman's book, The Reenchantment of the World, was a great find for me. The two most important concepts that I gleaned from his writings were those of a participatory science and or worldview and the disembodiment of knowledge. For some time, I had been struggling with what I called the myth of objectivity in psychology and psychotherapy. I could see how objectivity was a myth and how this myth was the very basis of psychology, all science, and psychotherapy. I saw that the ethics of psychotherapy were built on the belief that objectivity was possible and good. I put that together with my growing belief that the helping professions were the systematized practice of codependence and relationship addiction. And with my awareness that the function of addiction is to keep us out of touch with ourselves, and suddenly I could see why a non-participatory scientific worldview would result in an addictive society. We have set up a society in which we need to be out of touch with ourselves in order to tolerate the society we have created. At the same time, I was working on my recovery, and I could see that recovery demanded participation. One could not send others to meetings, observe step work, or understand addictions, and change or even understand recovery. I tried. In fact, the only way fully to know recovery was to do it. I found myself in an intensive struggle with my training, which dictated that I stay outside and observe, and my way of living, which was to jump in and do. I also noticed that as the 12-step work demanded participation, it also became a great leveler. There were no experts, no leaders, and no authorities. The ones who were the best teachers were often those who had believed, who had behaved the worst before recovery. In this disease, we are all participants. The 12-step groups were the best example I found of an actual participatory worldview. Berman was saying that we had to have a participatory scientific worldview. Was science the key? Did science have to be the central thread for the changes that needed to take place? Certainly, Berman would have that perspective because that was his background. Or was science even capable of evolving a worldview? I had observed that cultures that are based upon economics were not very viable. And I had been intrigued with cultures in which spirituality and the nurturing of that spirituality were core to the culture. Part of the problem in Eurocentric cultures stems from building a culture based on the belief that a very limited mechanistic science is the only valid approach to truth. Is science central to where we go from here? As I write this, I believe science and the development of a new science will be important. And I do not think that science itself will be the core out of which the new paradigm evolves. Scientists have been the guides, the priests, the politicians, and the warriors who have led us into this modernist worldview. I am not sure they will be the ones to lead us out of it, and I am sure that their cooperation and participation will be essential. What does a participatory scientific worldview entail? It releases us from the myth of objectivity, for one thing. Berman says that the last really participatory science was alchemy, and he does not recommend that we return to alchemy. But we have to move on. To do this, we must let go of being disembodied. This idea caught my attention because I had, over the years, developed a complete admiration of the material stored in our bodies. I remember remarking once, a few years after graduate school, that no one had ever told me about the body, except for Perfield's work on stimulating specific memories in the brain. I learned physiology and anatomy, but no one ever really told me that depression, memories, awareness, images, and specific sensations are stored 
in the body. I realized that in my doctoral training, I had learned very little about the body except to see it as a medicine. I'm sorry, a machine. When I thought about it, I realized that somewhere along the line in the process of my education, I had unknowingly developed the image that depression, memories, awareness, and so forth were all lurking somewhere within a foot of my head. I laugh when I think of this now, but no one ever even suggested that the body held memories that our brains did not even remember. It is now obvious to me that although it was never said, my education clearly suggested that the brain was the most important aspect of my physical being, that it controlled the body, and that it should be in control. There was no real recognition that the body too can remember, that feelings are necessary to the brain, that the brain needs the body for full information, and that the memories and feelings stored in the body are in most instances more accurate than those stored in the brain. What a revelation it was in this work to see that the body often is the seat of the most clearly stored information and that the only way to participate fully in our lives is to use our bodies, brains, feelings, intuitions, awareness, and thoughts. I also saw that the emphasis on thinking and leading with our brains had indeed resulted in a disembodiment of our knowing and therefore a distortion of our knowledge and an inability to receive and understand a large portion of the information that was actually available to us. It was more than a matter of not operating on all cylinders. We did not have cylinders at all. As a species and as a race, we were not e using even one-tenth of the information and knowledge of which we are capable. In deep process work, I could see that not only were we able to know much more than we thought we could, we could handle it. In order to participate in our lives and in our world, we had to be in our bodies and open to the information that is stored there. These two concepts of embodiment and participation are antithetical to a mechanistic scientific worldview. In order to participate in our lives, we have to relinquish our illusions of objectivity, staying outside and observing, and control. I could not recover from my addictions when I wanted to observe recovery. Only when I threw myself into full participation could I start recovery. In order to participate fully, I had to be in touch with my body and the messages it was giving me. I could not afford the illusion of safety in just thinking about my disease and recovery. Of course, as I participated, I changed. Often, when I think of and try to imagine a fully participatory science, my mind boggles, which is probably a good sign now that I think of it. I would like to share a recent example of a process that moved me to a new level of awareness about the immense shift that will be required in order to develop a participatory science. I recently spent some time in Ireland for the first time. This was a very important visit for me because when I was growing up, my mother used to say to me as an explanation for many behaviors, we're Irish. My mother has been dead for many, many years, but I have not forgotten her very hot temper and how she often blew up. The beauty of my mother's temper was that after she had exploded, there was no lingering anger. She was finished with it. I realized when I was a therapist that credit for much of my ability to be comfortable with the rage work of my clients belonged to my mother. Anger simply wasn't dangerous. It was only dangerous when it wasn't expressed or when it was expressed at someone. This type of temper was always explained as being because we're Irish. We had a gift of gab because we're Irish. So much of our reality was attributed to being Irish. She often accused me of having kissed the Blarney Stone. We had a quick sense of humor because we're Irish. We grew up with a sense of never having met a stranger, only friends we hadn't made yet, because 
were Irish. For the past few years, I have been reading the work of Irish writers and novelists, and I have been amazed at the many familiar chords struck in me. This sense of familiarity was only intensified by being in Ireland. This current trip was precipitated, I believe, by a talk I had recently had with an Aboriginal elder in Australia. I was reflecting on my awareness of the amazing similarity between my belief system and theirs. She asked me what my family background was, and I said, English and Irish. She said, that explains it. The Irish are closer to the knowledge and awareness of tribal people than any other Western group. Of course, I then had to spend time in Ireland to check out what this means. When I got to Ireland, I was astonished at how Irish I really am. Many feelings, thoughts, and realizations flooded through me. I was unconsciously drawn to areas still steeped in pre-Christian tradition and to the Irish-speaking areas, and I felt at home. Where did this come from? Certainly from my mother. Yet, as I was driving along, I thought of her, and my awareness mind, not my thinking mind, played with my perceptions. Clearly, my mother was very Irish in her soul. Her father was Irish, and her mother was English. But her mother died in childbirth, and she was raised by her grandmother, her mother's mother, who was very English and very proper. This was the great-grandmother who made me put on white gloves to go to the country store when I was a little girl. My mother saw almost nothing of her father when she was growing up, yet she was very Irish. She and my great-grandmother were in constant conflict. My grandmother being a rigid, strict, proper Englishwoman, and my mother being a fiery, hot-tempered, intense Black Irishwoman. Years after both their deaths, I had a deep process precipitated by a rolfing session in which I realized that I was the bridge between these two powerful women who never could really understand one another. I loved and understood them both, and had both of them integrated in me, for which I am very grateful. But where did my strong connection with Ireland come from? My mother had very little contact with her father, or that side of the family. How did she know to be Irish? Before I went to Ireland, I talked with my aunt, who is the family historian, and I discovered that my Irish ancestors came to America in 1640, a long time ago. There are few of us left in Ireland, and as it turned out, we came from a family of scribes and writers. My mother was a writer and a poet, my children are writers. I fought being a writer and have finally succumbed. What does all this mean? How nice it was to have the time and space to let my mind play with these thoughts and memories as I sped through the Irish countryside. Then I began to think about the age-old issue in psychology of nature versus nurture. Are we basically determined by our genes or our environment? It was over 40 years ago that I entered the field of psychology, enough time to see the pendulum swing back and forth between these two through several cycles. Clearly, my experience with my mother would argue for nature, genes. Yet, was being a writer in the genes? That seemed a little far-fetched to me. Then I realized that nature-nurture was a dualism. I have come to believe that dualistic thinking is addictive thinking, and even when you say it is a little bit of both, that is still a dualistic thinking process. I thought again about nature and nurture. Both are part of the mechanistic worldview, and that worldview basically sets up human beings to be victims. It is a blaming, judgmental worldview that sees people as acted upon from outside and victims of that acting upon. Suddenly, I could see how the nature-nurture argument promoted victimization. We are either victims of our genes, or we are victims of our environment. I could see how psychotherapy had played into this judgmental, dualistic victimization, and frankly, I was shaken and appalled. 
my mother was clearly not a victim of either her genes or her rearing. Although she had many reasons to become a victim in her life, she steadfastly refused to see herself that way. If neither of these was really as relevant, or if they weren't the answer, then what was? With addictive system dualism, the only way to escape dualistic thinking is to jump off and embrace the third option, which means starting with our own process and our own participation. At that moment, I felt as though I had moved into an altered state and was in a void. Not a void that was nothing, but a void that was something. I could see my mother participating in the hollow movement that is all creation, and in that participation, pulling out what was required for her living of her life. I had a sudden, deep awareness of how it was possible to see the entire universe from a completely different perspective. I know that perspective already exists, but we cannot know what it is unless we participate in it. I felt my fear and my wonderment and saw the secure of the old mechanistic psychological paradigm slipping away from me before I had concepts or words to describe the new one. I could see why Willis Harmon has said, psychology will of course be totally different. It was clear to me at that moment that psychology as we know it cannot exist. I wondered if perhaps it cannot exist at all. I remembered the first recent work on stretchable genes and wondered what full participation in our lives, working through all our deep processes and dysfunctional patterns, and full participation in the hollow movement of the universe would mean for one individual and the planet and the universe. What if our full participation in our process were the answer to our genes and our environment? What if both were infinitely changeable or stretchable as we participate with ourselves? I had seen hints of this in deep process work. What unimagined possibilities would there be for the human race and the planet if each one of us fully participated in all the aspects of our own lives, adding worked through personal experiences to the real evolution of the planet? What if this mechanistic scientific worldview and all the systems that have been developed to support it, including education, politics, religion, psychology, and medicine, have resulted in a blocking of the normal process of participation and growth that is the universe? And what if the only real way to know this process is fully to participate in it? I was aware of the anxiety, fear, and excitement I felt in facing the unknown and the false security that a dualistic, static, mechanistic, non-participatory scientific worldview had lulled me into when, indeed, I still had to face the unknown in spite of this false security. This system did not take care of the unknown or remove the need for my participation in it. It had only not given me the tools for this participation or the faith to try it. As I careened down narrow Irish roads, I had a true glimpse and awareness of what a fully participatory scientific worldview could mean, and felt a sobering frustration with how difficult it is to articulate that knowing. My mother was a participator. Uh, my mother was a participator. Much of her Irishness was, I believe, due to her willingness to participate in her life and be open to processes, forces, energies, connections, and entities that have yet have as yet gone unnamed in a non-participatory worldview. She embraced the opportunity to be open to and pull out of the hollow movement what she needed to be fully herself, and she put back into it that which she had to contribute not fully because she was plagued with a struggle to find meaning in and fit into an illusionary system. I struggled to find neat, concise terms to articulate an understanding of this new awareness that would be as clear as nature nurture. They did not and have not come. 
I was so filled with these new ideas and new awareness that I thought I had to stop the car and write them down immediately. And yet, at night, when I had time alone to write, I avoided it. I have long been aware that writing and true creativity are similar to having an orgasm. I understand that it is not possible really to write or be creative unless one is willing to let go and turn oneself over completely to the process. I know that sometimes my avoidance of my writing may look like writer's block when it is really just a fear of that letting go and plunging in and giving myself over to it. This writing felt even bigger. I sensed that if I really plunged into this awareness process, it would be very powerful. I felt right on the cusp of articulating some ideas that could be the seed for a new way of thinking about psychology, about ourselves and our universe. I did not feel ready to plunge in completely. Right now, I feel that an understanding of these issues I have raised, stretchable genes, deep process work, participatory science, ways of knowing, the hollow movement of the universe and our place in it, are right on the tip of my brain, and I am not ready to know what a fully participatory science or living worldview would be like. Yet I have an intriguing and curious glimpse, thanks to my mother and her Irishness, and I know that part of being Irish is being open to when and where this participa participation will take me. Clearly, even the process that I have just described is one of a participatory way of living and thinking. I trusted my intuition to go to Ireland and explore things Irish. When my mind began to explore this awareness, I did not try to think about these ideas. I let them think me. When I experienced my fear and avoidance, I honored them, trusting that they are there for a reason and that if I am meant to explore these issues further and have more ability to describe what this participatory worldview has to do with my mother, I will know when the time comes. All I have to do is keep open and participate in my life. Instead of reducing our lives and the influences of them to the nature-nurture dualism, I began to think in terms of the possibilities and options for participation. Can participation change the future? Can it change the past? What if we truly take our place in the puzzle of the universe? Does that change the entire universe? What does all this mean about the power of taking responsibility, not blame, for our lives? What if individual people took responsibility for their lives and did not turn that responsibility over to people who did not and could not have their genes? stretchable though they may be, and experiences, changeable though they may be, and therefore could not know from their perspective what kind of particip participation was needed in the world. What if a new scientific paradigm encouraged and enhanced a science, a politics, an education, a religion, and even a psychology, for want of a better words at this time, that supported, encouraged, allowed, and facilitated full participation in the life of the universe for all out of their own life experiences and truths. The possibilities are electrifying. What would science look like if it were not mechanistic, reductionist, and controlling? It is not the seeking to understand nature that is so destructive. It is the way that we try to use that understanding to control and exploit nature that destroys. Suppose that we sought to understand nature and the forces in the universe, not by analyzing them, picking them apart, making them static, and trying to reduce them to their simplest parts. Suppose we tried to understand them with all aspects of our being by participating with them and developed a science that could do that. The possibilities are limitless. I remember an example that I used in one of my books, I believe it was Women's Reality, about a realization I had at one point many years ago listening to a news announcement. 
The reporter said that scientists in Washington, D.C. had announced that if they had only a few million or billion, I don't remember now, dollars for further research, they could completely control the weather. I was astounded. Who would want to do that? I used it as an example of the difference between what I then called the white male system and the emerging female system. I remember thinking that in an emerging female system, we could spend a part of that money learning how to live more effectively with the weather. We probably could not control it anyway, which would be a participatory system and have money left over to deal with world hunger, pollution, and other more important issues. What I described in women's reality was a participatory system. I certainly did not realize then the implications of what that meant to the extent that I do now. Earlier, I quoted a paper by Carl Rogers called Toward a More Human Science of the Person. In it, he stressed that a mechanistic science was not particularly suitable for or congenial to the study of the human condition. Yet he, like most of us, tended to cling to the more conventional concepts of science. He quotes Patton, Polkinghorn, and Miles and Huberman in looking at phenomenological research, hermeneutics, and qualitative research. Some of these approaches suggest the possibility for a more participatory science without, I believe, really seeing the revolutionary implications of a fully participatory science. Most of these writers wanted to broaden the scope of humanistic research without moving to a new scientific paradigm. Still, they have paved the way to do just that. In this world of stretchable genes and fuzzy thinking, anything is possible. However, I believe it will be some time before we have adequate language to describe a fully participatory science. We do have some clues that move, be, move us beyond concepts like participant observer, experimenter bias, and phen phenomenological concepts that still do not really explore what a fully participatory science would be. If we participate, uh, if we participate fully, we also change what we are observing. If we participate fully, we change. Mechanistic science does not give us much help in thinking in these terms. <laughs>